you today with a reverence, with an awe of your glory, of your holiness, of your goodness. God, we don't just walk into a room and receive. God, we give you honor. We give you praise and we give you our worship. And you give us confidence. And you give us wholeness. But God, today I just say that you are worthy and there is no one like you. There is no one like you for me. In my life, the things you've brought me through, the testimony that I have of your faithfulness. And I pray for the one that's in the room that needs to feel you in a new way. God, you are so faithful to show us. And God, I ask today that we're obedient, that we listen to your voice, we obey your word. And I know that you show up every time, every time. We may not understand it, but we trust you today, God. We trust you with all that we have, with all that we are. We trust you, we put our faith in you. We love you and we bless your name today. It's in that name we pray, amen, amen. Come on church, let's celebrate one more time, Jesus today. Amen, amen. Were you glad to be at church today? Isn't it so good, it's so good. Why don't you turn to those around you, say welcome to church, and then go ahead and take your seat. excited that you're here today. Let's take a look at what's coming up. Here at City Hope, we have an incredible correctional ministry where we get the opportunity to take City Hope to four of Alabama's correctional facilities each and every week. Currently, we have City Hope campuses in Holman, Fountain, Fountain Annex, and Loxley Correctional Centers. And we'll soon be launching our fifth ministry in Mobile on April 9th. We would love to invite men that are ages 19 and above to join these teams who help go inside the prisons and serve every week. However, we also have opportunities open to anyone to respond to prayer requests weekly through what we call our correspondence team. You can also serve and show appreciation to correctional officers and staff through periodic outreaches that we get to do. So for more info or to sign up to serve, you can go to cityhope.cc correctional. Throughout the year, some students rely solely on school meals to eat. So when summer rolls around, they have a hard time getting meals. We have an opportunity every year to partner with local schools to identify families that are struggling to make ends meet, and we get to provide them with groceries all summer long. There are three ways you can help with this. First is bringing non-perishable food items. Every Sunday, now through July, you can bring canned goods and non-perishable food items and drop them off in the lobby. You can also adopt a family. You'll be assigned to a specific family, shop for the groceries, and personally deliver them the last Saturday of May, June, and July. Then there's our delivery team where you can sign up to pack and deliver groceries. For more information and to sign up, you can visit cityhope.cc outreach. Ladies, this one's for you and I could not be more excited. We will be having our Daughter's Night of Worship on April 24th at our Malvis campus. We've experienced years of unique conferences and we've consistently seen the fruit of that. So we are thrilled for this additional time to worship together. It's going to be a night to worship the Lord through song and make space for the Holy Spirit to speak. So come expectant and invite a friend. We're excited to kick off our new series today, Let's Talk About It, where, you guessed it, we're going to talk about it. Anything and everything that might be a hot cultural subject. Today, we're gonna to tackle the topic of politics 
And next week, we're going to talk about the church. We're going to talk about deconstruction. And we're going to talk about why the church matters. On some other weeks, we may discuss more sensitive topics that may not be appropriate for your children. And we're going to do our best to give you a heads up on those weeks so you can make plans to check your children into Kid City. If you want to dive deeper into this week's subject or any of the weeks coming up, we've created a resource page at cityhope.cc slash resources. It's going to have a selection of books related to each week's topic. We know the content of this series is going to help us understand these topics in a deeper way, and it's going to equip us to be able to talk about it ourselves. How are we feeling this morning? My name is Nathan. I'm the missions pastor here. just want to welcome you. Hopefully you're he- feeling the presence of the Lord, but you're also feeling at home uh, here with us and the City Hope family. If this is your first time visiting with us, we would love for you to reach back in the seat in front of you or somewhere around your ankles if you're in the risers and grab that connect card. This is our way to start our relationship with you. So take a moment, fill that out. You can drop it off in one of the offering boxes located around the campus or better yet, bring it to one of our volunteers and we would love to give you a gift and just get to know you a little better. So thank you for doing that with us today. We've had an amazing past two weeks here at City Hope, haven't we? Two weeks ago, we had our Holy Week experience where we were vulnerable. We laid our sins at the cross. We took communion together on Good Friday. We brought our families to have an intimate time of flowering the old, ugly, rugged cross and making it come to life again with those beautiful flowers, giving hope for us. And last week, this place was packed out with four services to celebrate our risen Savior. Now, how many of you have been drawn closer to the Lord in these past two weeks through one of those events? Amen. Amen, God's so good. Thank you for inviting your friends and your family. And if you are one of those people who have recently put your faith in Jesus, we wanna tell you about your next step here in your faith journey. And that is to go through our baptism class. In two weeks, April 21st, we'll have our next baptism class. You can sign up at cityhope.cc cc slash baptism and this is your chance to get to know what baptism is all about find out why we're doing it and how you can make your public declaration of faith and we can't wait to see you take that next step also if you're new to the family here today right after this service in the lobby we have welcome to city hope this is a free luncheon food is provided child care is provided we just want you to show up to hear the history of city hope to hear where we're going in the next 15 years and the vision that God has given us, but also to answer some of your questions and get to meet some of the staff here. We hope you'll just, you don't have to sign up. We just want you to show up right after the service in the lobby. And because I am the missions pastor, my shameless plug, come see me or one of our volunteers in the lobby today. We have a missions booth set up. We wanna help find you a perfect mission trip where you can live out your faith internationally or even our own backyard in New Orleans this year. So come find us after the service. But now we're gonna jump, to, jump into our brand new series, Let's Talk About It. What's up, church? How's everybody doing? Welcome, 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 church, uh, wherever you're watching from, whatever campus. Um, Correctional Center campus is online. It's so good to have you with us this weekend. Uh, Church family everywhere, I do want to welcome for the very first time, we have a new campus uh, this weekend. Our fifth Correctional Center campus uh, will be joining us this week. So we have a brand new member of our family. So at every campus, put your hands together one more time and let's welcome... Let's welcome them. It is the, uh, the mobile work release. So guys, we are so glad that you're part of our family. We're so glad that you're with us um, today. And church, we are kicking off a new series today. Um, is anybody excited about this series? Okay, good. Uh, good, well today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how Jesus would approach politics. Are you still excited about this series? 
Okay. Okay. Um, Because you can kind of cut the tension with a knife, you know, like a little bit. Like there's just a little bit of like, "Ah, I don't know. Anybody nervous? You just kind of feel, okay, there's a couple of you honest. Okay, good. Anybody anybody, um, scared? You're like, what is this guy going to say? Okay, there's a couple. I was not expecting that. Great. Okay. Um, well, listen, we're going we're gonna to jump right in, but I do want to just, let me just inst- give you one little bit of instruction as we do. Um, if you will, everybody at every campus, um, if you would just kind of reach over um, and grab that seat belt that we had installed and just go ahead and um, insert the flat part into the buckle, you know what I'm saying, and, and test it and make sure that it is, uh, it is well tight and secure and you're not going to um, you're not going to go anywhere because uh, this is going to be a fun ride, a really, really, really fun ride. Um, you know, politics is, as we all know, um, maybe the most divisive thing in our culture right now, right? Just, it just, when you throw all the issues and all the topics at it, it's just we are so divided as a nation. Um, and so what that means is we have to talk about this. We have to talk about this because there is a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. One, politics matter. Um, And politics matter not because they are some philosophical idea out there somewhere that just kind of, you know, is just ideals. No, it matters because politics impact people, right? It impacts our personal lives. And so it, it matters. But even more than that, the stakes are even higher because it's all about, or the stakes are high because of the unity of the church, because of how important it is that we walk through this season unified, because the mission of Jesus is reliant on the unity of the church. And you may not realize that, and maybe that I'm saying it in a way that you've not thought of before, but it is so important that as the church, we walk through this season um, unified, and we understand that. The stakes are so, so high. So as we approach this, we're, we're kind of looking for asking a few things. One is we're looking for God's wisdom. Um, and I would say this, I'm asking you to kind of step into this conversation with me with humility, because what I'm wanting to do or what I'm hoping to do is to elevate our perspective. Okay, I wanna elevate our perspective. I wanna get us out of all of the, the news pundits and the social media and all the, all, the, all the stuff that we hear 24-7, kind of that echo chamber where we just keep hearing and pounding the same perspectives over and over and over again. The hope today is that if you come with some humility and we'll come with, God, with God's wisdom, that we will be elevated above that and we'll actually be able to kind of see a bigger picture of what God is wanting to do through his church. So are you with me? Okay. Okay, well, let's jump right in. So I already told you to put on your seatbelt, and I did that because, as I said, we're going for an elevated perspective. So I want you to just kind of imagine, if you will, we're in the mountains somewhere, and we're driving up a a curvy mountain road, right? And on either side, at different times, as you curve, there are these massive cliffs, these drop-offs, these ravines, and it just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. So as we go to an elevated perspective, what I want you to understand as we go there is that we need some guardrails to get us there, okay? And so what I want to do is I want to give you three guardrails that for you and I, as we approach or engage politics in this season, three guardrails that will be so, so important, vital for us um, as we do this. So if you're taking notes, is anybody taking notes? Look at you guys. You're getting better and better. Every time I mention it, more of you are taking notes. That's awesome. All right, listen, here's the first guardrail. We're gonna jump in right here. Here we go. Number one, we have to remember our primary identity and focus. In a season like this, it's really, really easy for us to lose both our identity and our focus. And so we, a guardrail that we need as we enter this season between now and November and beyond is we need to remember our primary identity and our focus. Um, let me remind you of what Paul said in Philippians 3.20. He said it this way. He said, but our, citizens, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to understand, that you are a citizen of heaven before you are an American. Okay, this is, this is so important for us to understand. And I know we kind of, if you've been around church, you kind of know that. Right, But this, when, again, as we enter this season, this is such an important truth for us to grab hold of and to live out of, that our primary citizenship is not of this earth. 
It is not of this world. This nation that we are in is a part of the kingdoms of the world. And you and I, as citizens of heaven, we are a part of a higher kingdom than that. We are a part of the kingdom of heaven, right? You with me? Okay, so what that means is, what that means is that you, as a citizen of heaven, have more in common with, citizen, with other citizens of heaven than you do anyone that's not a citizen of heaven. Okay, you following me? Let me just, let, let's just keep teasing this out a little bit more because I really want you to grab it, okay? As a citizen of heaven, okay, as a believer, as a Christ follower, you have more in common. If you are a Christian and a Republican, you have more in common with a Christian who is a Democrat, right? Because your citizenship is in heaven, you have more in common with them than you would a Republican who is not a Christian. Okay, are you following me? Okay, I know it's confusing and it's kind of hard to understand, but if you are a believer, if you're a citizen of heaven, you have more in common with someone who is of the opposite party and is a Christian than someone who is of the same party and is not a Christian, okay? But we can take this even further, okay? Because America is one nation on this massive planet, okay? So as a citizen of heaven, you have more in common with a Honduran that is also a citizen of heaven than you have an American who is not a citizen of heaven, okay? You have more in common with a Mexican who is a citizen of heaven than an American who is not a citizen of heaven. You have more in common with an Iranian who is a citizen of heaven than you have with someone who is an American and not a citizen of heaven. Are we all on the same page, okay? Again, We have to elevate our perspective and understand our loyalty, okay? Our citizenship is not on this earth. It is is to a kingdom greater than any kingdom that is on this earth right now, any kingdom, okay? His kingdom will never fall. Nations rise and fall all through history. Great nations like ours have risen and fallen, but the kingdom of God will never fall, ever, Okay, that's our citizenship. But our citizenship doesn't end with just this little membership card that we have. No, we're called to something. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. He said, we are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We are called, we're not just citizens, we're also ambassadors back to this world. So we're citizens of heaven called to be image bearers. We're called to be culture carriers. We're called to be his agents. In other words, we're called to be on mission in the kingdoms of the world, wherever we're placed, right? You and I, we're placed here, but people are placed all over the world and they're placed there as an ambassador to bring the kingdom of God to that place. Okay, that's the mission that we've been sent on. That's why we are here. We are here to bring that kingdom reality to this place. And we know, we look at it and we know it needs the kingdom reality, right? And our job is to live that out, is to be an ambassador in this place, okay? And then one last verse when it comes to our identity is this. Uh, Peter says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. I love what Peter points out here. He says, hey, listen, you should feel like you don't belong here. You should feel like a foreigner. You should feel like an exile. You should feel like a a sojourner in some translations, which means just passing through. In other words, it shouldn't feel comfortable. It shouldn't feel right. There should be a little bit of angst. There should be a little bit like this just doesn't fit. Why? Because this is a kingdom of the world and you are a part of the kingdom of heaven. So it's not gonna feel right. It's not gonna feel normal, but we have a mission on this earth. Okay, and that's the next part of this. So we've got identity and then we've got focus, our primary focus. We cannot lose our primary focus. Let me just tell you, our primary focus is not political. I'm not saying it's not important. It is important, but it's not our primary focus. Okay, let's go back to what Paul said in Philippians 3.20. He said, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we all know. You look out at our world. It doesn't matter what side you're on, left, right, middle. It doesn't matter where you are. You look at our world and you go, it's broke. Right, it's messed up. 
There's injustice, there's abuse, there's sin, there's whatever you wanna lay, whatever you wanna throw at it, you would say, absolutely, it's there, it's broken, okay? Let me ask you this. What is going to save our world? I can tell you what's not going to save our world. Politics. Politics will not save our world. That's not to mean it's not influential. It's as influential as any other field in our world that can bring good to earth, but it is not what's going to save. If we think that a candidate or a party or anything else is a savior type that's going to solve everything, we are dead wrong. Because look at what Paul says. What we are eagerly awaiting is a savior from there. Guys, the only savior that you and I are waiting for is Jesus Christ. Our focus is on him coming to this earth and him solving all of the problems, okay? So our focus is there. Is it a savior from there? And we know one day he's coming back and he's gonna set everything to rights. We know that. I wanna wanna read this quote. Uh, It's by a pastor by the name of John Ortberg. And I, I love this. He's a pastor and an author and I think this really paints a good picture for us. He says, imagine that we elected all the right people to the right offices, president, Congress, governors, right down to the school board, city council members, and dog catcher. Let's imagine that all those ideal office holders instituted all the right policies. Let's imagine that we got all the propositions right, every piece of legislation from zoning laws to tax codes to immigration policy to crime bills is just exactly the way you know it ought to be. Would that usher in the kingdom of God? Would the hearts of the parents be turned toward their children? Would all the marriages be models of faithful love? Would greed and pride be legislated out of existence? Would human beings now at last be able to master our impulses in areas of sexuality and anger and narcissism? Let's get a little bit more personal. Would you finally become the woman or man you know you ought to be? I don't think so. You see, it's not that politics are insignificant. It's just that politics aren't the answer. Jesus is the answer. The only one who can save is Jesus. And Pastor Tony Evans, he said this one time, he said, Jesus didn't come to take sides. Jesus came to take over, right? Jesus came to take over and one day he will fully come and take over. But that is our focus as we walk through this. Our identity is we're not citizens of this place, but we are ambassadors here bringing God to this place. We're on mission with him. We're exiles, but our focus is on him. We remember whose we are and why we are here. Okay, so that's guardrail number one. Are you ready for number two? Can you handle it? Do we need to shake it out a little bit? You need to take a deep breath. Everybody good? Y'all kind of quiet. I'm just... Here's number two. We have to allow our faith filter to come before our party filter. Okay, some of y'all are some party people. You know what I'm saying? Right, your your allegiance and your loyalty is party before faith. Okay, we have to allow ourselves to become faith people. And we need that faith filter to overcome our party filter. Okay, have to. We have to become people of the word. I don't know if you've ever done this before, if you've ever done a food journal where you kind of take note of everything you've eaten in a week. Uh, You're kind of keeping track of what you're eating. I I would challenge you to take a a news intake versus Bible intake journal. First service did that little moo right there too, the little (laughs) mmm. I don't know if that's a mmm, no sir, I don't think I will do that. Or if that's a, mm, that's really good, I think it will. I don't know what it is, but we got some booing folks today, okay? But think, just think about how helpful that would be in what's going on in our world right now for you to up your Bible intake and lower your news intake, right? Because what needs to happen is our primary like, source that is forming our perspective has to be God's word. 
It cannot be, and here's what we do. We get into our little, our little partisan bubbles, our little echo chambers, our social media and our news, and we're just the same perspectives being re- just formed over and over and over again, hearing the same old thing. What you need is some elevation. What we all need is some elevation. We've got to get more of God's word. We've got to, that's got to be what's forming our perspective. Now, full disclosure, okay? Let me be real honest with you. That sounds really, really good, and you mood, so it must be right. Okay, but let me warn you, that is a lot harder than it seems. Because it's actually pretty fuzzy. It's not as clean cut, cut black and white as we would want it to be. Okay, there are people in this room right now um, that are, let me ask you this, have you ever asked yourself if Jesus would be a Republican or a Democrat? Have you ever asked yourself that? Most likely no, because you assume that he would be exactly what you are, right? That's what we do, right? We assume, I mean, and it kind of makes sense, right? You think you're a Jesus person, so Jesus would vote how I vote. Kind of backwards, right? It's kind of not really the right way to think about it, but just a couple of years, actually last year, I was in a pastor's cohort with a 10 or 12 other guys from around the nation, all over the nation. And as we're sitting there in this room, what I found out is that half the room leaned one direction and the other half leaned the other direction. And both halves would say, I don't understand how a Bible-believing Christian could vote that. Both sides of the room would say that. In other words, if you're a Democrat or Republican, you most likely would say, I don't understand how a Bible-believing Christian could vote the other direction, right? It happens everywhere. It happens in every Christian circle and every church, and it's why churches are being blown up and the church is disunified right now, right? Because that is the reality. That is the truth, and it's that way because of our filters. It's that way because we focus on the issues that matter to us. It, 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 it's a big deal because it's the way we were brought up. It's our background. It's our context. It's the, it's, it's kind of the, it's the lens through which you see the world that's kind of dictating ultimately how you read the Bible and what's most important. It's kind of just affirming and confirming what you want it to be. For instance, let me just, let's just tease this out a little bit more. I feel the tense in the room already. I feel like I need to do a little song and a dance just to break the ice. I'm not, but I feel like I need to. But let's just tease this out a little bit, okay? If you're a conservative and you say, no doubt about it, God's a conservative, right? Now, there's no doubt about it. And, and, and here's what would kind of affirm that, right? That he is pro-business and work rather than welfare for those who can work. He values the life of the unborn. He gives greater wealth to some more than others and calls that good. He upholds the family as the basic social structure for the church and the world. He says marriage is between a man and a woman. You would read that list and you would go, see, told you. Look at that, see, I'm telling you, man, God's a conservative. But then you could go, well, I don't know. You look at it through the lens of a progressive and you look at the Bible and it would say this, that he demands that government care for the poor. He calls for massive debt forgiveness. He demands we care for the environment. He pronounces judgment on those who don't pay fair wages. He is always for the immigrant. He hates injustice, including economic, racial, and gender injustices. Huh. Could it be possible that no one political party fully encompasses the kingdom of God. Why? Why? Because this, my friends, is a kingdom of the world, not a kingdom of God. So you know what? There is no perfect party. There is not going to be a perfect party that fully encompasses exactly what we want it to look like, what we think it should look like. Why? Because you and I, every single one of us, we come to this looking at it through our own lens and our own perspective and our own way. We filter it through what we've experienced in our life, what issues are important to us, and we make those things the most important. And then what we end up doing is we filter Jesus through that and we say, well, that's how God would vote. That's how Jesus would vote, 
right? But it's our perspective. There's nothing wrong with that, but we have to kind of call it as it is and go, you know what? That's my perspective. That's, that's the history that I've had before or the way that I see or the way that I think, and that's why I interpret it that way. The way that you and I have to come to this is that we have to find biblical common ground. Okay, this is the starting place. This is the place where we as a church can be unified and healthy and whole and have some different opinions, but still be unified and whole and protect the unity of the church. In other words, what we do is we unify around biblical common ground, not all the stuff underneath it. We unify here. We unify around the fact that, hey, this is, what I, this is what the word of God says. This is where our unity is. And then this is where there can be disagreement. And you know what is amazing? Disagreement on these things is okay. It's actually healthy. Diversity at this level is okay. But the, moment, the problem comes in whenever we try to unify over one of these things down here. If we try to unify over something down here, then that's where there's problems. We unify here over what the word of God says. And then you go, you know what? The way it's interpreted out, the way it's lived out, how this gets fleshed out in culture and government and every other walk of life, there's some disagreement there and that can be okay. Let's take poverty, for example. The issue of poverty, we would all agree. It doesn't matter where you are, left, right. We're all gonna agree that God cares about the poor, period. Right? I mean, just from the words of Jesus alone, you could go on and on and on about how Jesus cares for the poor. We get that. Okay? So biblical common ground is God's heart breaks for the poor. Now, one side's going to say, hey, the the government should step in and should solve this problem. One side's going to step in and say, no, the government shouldn't step in and solve this problem. That, you know, should be hard work and it should be generosity, whatever. Like, there's going to be disagreements here, but the, the, the unity is built on the common ground of the Bible, Scripture. Okay? Then down here is where we can actually have healthy conversation. Because here's what I know. All the issues that are floating around, I don't have all of the perspective on all of those issues. For instance, poverty. I have a very limited perspective and context on the issue of poverty. But my guess is there are some people listening to me right now that have a very different context of poverty because you've lived it and I haven't. Right, So that person is coming to that issue with a completely different idea, opinion, perspective that would be really healthy for me to sit down and understand that perspective. For me to be able to talk to someone and go, okay, I know what the Bible says. The Bible says that we should care for the poor. Now let's talk about how that's supposed to happen. Right? Is this making sense? There's biblical common ground that actually creates the unity so that we can be a healthy and unified church. One of the, I think one of the most beautiful pictures of this, and there's quite a few in the New Testament, but just one that I just, is one of my favorite pictures is uh, two of the disciples that Jesus chose. Okay, he chose Simon the Zealot and he chose Matthew the tax collector. Okay, these two, politically, these two guys could not have been more opposite. Okay, could not have been more opposite. Simon the Zealot was, uh, was a very strict and zealous, obviously, which kind of fanatic. They were very much kind of this anarchist. They believed in violence. They would actually attack. They, had, they kept swords or small knives on them. They would actually attack Roman guards. Like that was their approach to Israel taking over the oppressors. And then you've got Mac, Matthew the tax collector who's working for the oppressors who's kind of signed up with the enemy and said, hey, I'm gonna work with you to actually kind of continue to oppress my brothers and sisters. Two very different extremes. So in our context, you could think someone from the extreme left, someone from the extreme right, right? And Jesus chose them both. Think about that. Jesus chose them both. Now, I imagine that the campfire conversations were pretty incredible. (laughs) At least early on. But what happened is, you see, Jesus, when he came along, he didn't didn't pick this way. He didn't pick that way. He didn't even pick the middle. Jesus went up. Jesus called them up. 
Why? Because that's where the kingdom of God is. Right? He called them into discipleship. He called them into a life of obedience. And what happened is along the way, Jesus challenged them and moved them to a new reality, to an elevated perspective where they could see things, live things out differently together. Okay, by the end of the three and a half years that Jesus was with them, these two guys, with their time with Jesus and their time with one another, they grew. Like their perspective changed. They, become, they became pillars of the church. And when it started off, they were on complete opposite ends. Why? Because Jesus, being the word of God, was the common biblical ground. He was the unifying force that called them up to a new perspective, to a new place. And when that happens, we can actually have diversity and it's healthy. We can have different opinions and different thoughts and it can be healthy. Listen, we can vote different and it can be okay. Right? Because we are strangers. We are exiles. We don't belong here. But our role is to influence, to do whatever we can do to bring the kingdom of God here. And when you look at the first century church, it's really astounding. The mark, and we've talked about this even back in He Holds the Future, we talk about the the impact that the early church had on the first century, second century world. That by by the third century, um, Rome had become a quote unquote Christian nation. Now it didn't last long, it eventually fell, but they became a quote unquote Christian nation. It was the official language all because of the, the church, man, the, 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 just the, 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 the way that they were ambassadors in that time, the way that they came in, countercultural. They lived differently than everybody else. There's a scholar who, um, who's a professor in England. He wrote a book called uh, Destroyer of the Gods. His name is Larry, Her- Larry Hurtado. Uh, it's a fascinating book, but it's all about the rise of the early church. It's all about how in the world did this ragtag bunch of misfits kind of overthrow the kingdom. Like how did they come in through their faith, through their good works, through just their their Jesus following ways? Like how did they make such an impact in the first century? And it's because they were countercultural. But I wanna show you the five marks. This is what Larry says, the five marks of the early church. This is what kind of set them apart. This This is why they were successful. Okay, it was completely different than the world around them. This is why they were successful. The first one is this, is that they were multi-ethnic and multiracial. Okay, in radical ways, they were, they were absolutely inclusive. They were, they, you, you probably remember this verse in Galatians 3. Uh, Paul said, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the way that they lived. I mean, this time in, in history was so tribal and every tribe had their own God. And yet the, these, this whole Jesus following bunch came in and said, you know what? Our God is for everyone. And they just tore down all these walls of division, right? And it absolutely in that time made a mark. It was huge for them. And the way that they demonstrated God's love, but that's not all. The second one is this, is that they cared for the poor. In radical, radical ways, they would, not out of their their excess, but out of their need, Not out of their surplus, but out of their lack. They would absolutely sell everything. I mean, Acts 2 tells us they would sell everything that they had if they could, and they would give it to those who didn't have food. Right? They went over the top to love those who were poor. And in the Roman culture, this was countercultural. It was absolutely astounding, and it got the attention of everyone. Number three, Larry says this. He says, the third thing is that they were pro-life. They were pro-life, and in that time, infanticide was the form of abortion. And in the Roman culture, it was, it was absolutely nothing. It was common for a baby to be born and for a parent to look at that baby and it be the wrong sex. It could be any reason, honestly. It had the wrong hair color. And they would, throw, they would literally throw that baby into a garbage pile. Archaeologists have found mass graves of babies. Because that was just, it was normal, it was natural, it was okay. If you don't want this child, throw it away. But it was the Christians who would go and rescue those babies out and then raise them as their own. 
Matter of fact, the first orphanages were started then because of this very thing. Right? They were literally pro-life. And then the fourth thing is this, is that they, they, they had the original Christian sex ethic. In other words, sexually, they were countercultural. Okay, you may think right now, sexually, our world is crazy, but in first century Rome, it was even crazier. But Christians held to the value of husband and wife for life. This is how we're gonna live. This is what it's gonna look like. And culture around them was completely different. I could tell you a few things, like from temple prostitutes, public prostitution is a, in, in, a, in a worshipful way, all the way to children being involved in sexual things, okay? At absurdity, and yet Christians would hold to, this is how we live sexually. Again, what did it do? It just caught the attention of everybody. Why are they living like this? They're just different. They're strange. They're weird. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but the first two of those issues are very progressive issues. The second two of those things are very conservative. But the fifth one, ain't nobody. (laughs) Here's the fifth one, that they were non-retaliatory. They were non-retaliatory. In other words, all the persecution that they endured from dictators and emperors and Caesar, all the things that we even talked about a couple of months ago, all the martyrs and all the things, never did they fight back. They suffered well. You look at the the stories of Paul and the persecution and the abuse and the things that were said to him, the things that were said about him, he never fought back. He never unleashed his mouth at them. He never fought back with his hands. He never did that. Why? Because they witnessed Jesus Christ go to the cross and and take on the ultimate form of unjust punishment. And he never said a word. Right? And they lived this way. Counter-cultural. This is absolutely beautiful. And it validates the Christian faith, right? That Jesus doesn't pick sides. Do y'all know Jesus isn't an American? Do we just need to say that? (laughs) Like Jesus doesn't pick sides, right? He elevates everything. See, this is so much more than one moment that you're gonna check on a ballot. It's about the life that you live every other moment of your life. Right? It's about how you live out the values from Scripture, from the life of Jesus, through discipleship in Jesus. It's how we live this out that actually impacts the world. You see, this is how the early church changed the world. Looks to me like we could possibly do the same if we begin to live this way, if we begin to live this out. What I want you to see is that there's so much more that unites us and tears us apart. And that brings me to the third and final guardrail. And that's this, for us to commit to unity inside and civility outside. Unity inside the church and civility outside the church. Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 4. He said, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Do whatever you have to do. Make every effort to keep the unity. Why? Jesus in John 17, he prays to God. He said, God, he's praying for you, by the way. He's not just praying for the 12. He's praying for you. For all of those who would believe, he prays that you and I would be one just as the Father and he were one so that the entire world would know the truth about who Jesus is. In other words, the entire mission of Jesus is riding on the unity of the church. And that was Jesus' prayer. And it's the prayer, it's, it's been said this way, I think I've said it this way, it's the only prayer Jesus prayed that you and I get to answer. We get to answer that prayer. Are we gonna be one, right? In other words, whenever the world looks and they go, it makes no sense that that group of people with all that diversity and all those different backgrounds and all those different things, it makes no sense that that group of people 
should be a people of love and peace and patience and should love each other and have unity. Even with all of these different political things, it makes no, the world should look at this group and go, man, that's just different. That's uncommon. That's weird. That's strange. It's almost like they don't belong here. It's almost like they're not a part of this. It's almost like they're elevated above this in some way. But what happens is we get down in the muck, in the mire, and we start acting like everybody else, and then we look like everybody else, and then the mission of Jesus Christ crumbles. Because we're not being the church that we're called to be. We're not living toward one another, loving each other. Look at what he said. How do we do this? No, go back. Let's go back to verse 1. How do we do this? How do we, how do we live this out? Be completely humble and be gentle be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's how we do it. That's, that's inside. That's unity inside. This is how we do it. But, but notice here what Paul says. He says, you got to make every effort. It, it's like, listen, he's not saying this is going to be easy. He's not saying unity within the church is going to be easy. Over the next few months, as we get closer and closer to November, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult to be humble when someone has a different view than you. It's going to be difficult to be gentle, to be patient, to bear with one another in love. It's going to be difficult. Paul says, listen, you got to fight for it. you got to do whatever you can do to keep the unity because it's that big of a deal. The mission of God relies on it for us to be one. And he says, here's how we can be one. Here's, here's where our oneness lies. Here's where our unity lies in verse 4. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Then he says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to be one, called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. In other words, politics will never unite us. The only thing that will unite us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what unites us. It's the only thing. That, that can unite. It's it. Right? It's elevating to this other perspective of going, no, where, where we're united is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what's important. Right? And that brings unity inside. But then there's also civility outside. The way we treat the world, the way we talk to the world, the way we the way we handle things, the way we post things, the way we say things. Paul in Titus 1. Our Titus 3, he said, remind the people, so I'm reminding the people, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. In Romans, Paul says, be respectful. Why? Because the authority that's been placed in authority has been placed there by God. So our role is to be respectful. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that you just fall in line and you have to obey every single thing if it, if it goes against Scripture. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, if at all possible, like, it, it, like you have this responsibility to slander no one, which means to speak evil of no one, to live peaceable with each other, with people outside this place, to live this kind of life out there so that they see the goodness of God. So they see something different, because guess what? That's different. If we lived that way, it would be very, very different. Right? Jesus calls us to be a light in a dark world. You know, I, I, I was reminded this week of the story in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus was arrested, actually at the moment Jesus was arrested. Whenever they came to arrest him, they came in what seemed very militant. They came to arrest him, they had soldiers and everybody with them. And Peter fought back. And do you remember how he fought back? He bowed up, he stepped up, he pulled the sword out, and he cut off the ear of the high priest servant, a guy named Malchus, cut his ear off. And I just thought this week, I thought, man, what a metaphor for our current political discourse. So often what we do is we come out the gate fighting, and when we come out of the gate fighting, we cut the ears off of the very person that, should, that we want to be able to talk to, listen to, and have a conversation with. Instead of doing what Paul says here, of coming in with peace, coming in with a humility, being peaceable, 
being able to have those kind of conversations, being a person of love and grace and truth. But understanding that every single person comes at this through their own lens, their own filter, their own perspective. I'll I'll recommend a book to you. Uh, It's a book called The Three Languages of Politics. It's not written by a Christian, but it's a really, really interesting book because what it does is it helps you see why people that are conservative are conservative. Okay, there's a lens that they're seeing the world through. Those that are progressive, those that, uh, there's three. I can't, I don't remember what the third category, but ultimately what, he, what this guy's doing is he's saying, listen, we're all coming at this thing through a lens and a filter. It's like different languages. It's like me going to Honduras. I went to Honduras a couple weeks ago, and whenever I preached, I had to have an interpreter. Why? Because I don't speak Spanish, right? If I, in English, and them in Spanish, we would just crisscross, and we'd never, ever get anywhere, right? Because we don't understand each other. The whole point in this book is that conservatives speak one language, and liberals speak another language, and it's like we're just continuing this hatred and this discourse and all this stuff because we're speaking two different languages, but it's like, man, what if we could kind of, what if we could find biblical common ground? And what if we could come at all of these things with humility and peace? And we could actually listen to one another. We can actually hear the heart of people and the, and the perspective and the background. I think people could really see just how uncommon it is to be a citizen of heaven. We'd start looking different, acting different, living different. And I think in that place, we have a chance to then change the world. And maybe just our community. Let's don't even say world. Let's, don't, let's just bring it right down to right here. Your neighborhood. Right? The places that you hang out, the friends that you have, the conversations that you have. What if we could come at them from a completely different place? I think we have the chance to change a lot. But here's the good news I want to leave you with because I'm out of time. The good news is is that we don't have to be overly worried about an election in November. All right, because our leader, our king doesn't need your vote, right? I mean, he's not coming with a name on a ballot. He's coming when he's ready to come because he's the king of the world. And that's really good news. Our hope doesn't have to be in an American political system. Our hope is not waiting on some person or something or some policy or something to get right. Boy, if that thing were just in place and it were right, it would just solve everything. It's not going to solve it. There's always going to be turmoil because we live in a fallen and broken world. But our hope has already come and our hope is promising that he's coming again. Listen, there is no political party or candidate that can save or destroy the work of God. Can you just sit in that for a second? Like, I know some of us are really worried about November. And there's fear, and, there, and, I, and some of it is legit, and I get it, man. Especially depending on, again, background and context and where you're coming from, I get it. But man, can we just sit in that reality that no decision, no election, no, 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 in that final, that night, how, how it all shakes out and it all ends is not going to determine the work of God. The will of God on this earth is still going to happen. He is the king. He is the one that we put our trust in, our faith in. He is the one that we stand on. And that's how we approach this. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much that you are our king, you're our savior, you're for us, you're with us, and I pray that we can be your ambassador on this earth. God, that we can truly represent you here. God, that we can live out this kind of life, Lord, with grace and humility and truth and love. God, that we can be your voice, we can be your people. God, we love you and we thank you so much, Jesus, and we give it all to you in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and and for experiencing this service with us. 
What we find in scripture is an encouragement, not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And the encouragement that we want to leave you with in light of that is don't let this just be content. You see, on this platform, you'll see a lot of content. There's a lot of things that can fill a lot of your time, but we want this to be more. We want this to be life transformative in the next step that it sets up in your life. On the screen right now, you're gonna see a QR code just kind of flash up there. We'd love for you to scan that QR code, and what it's gonna be is it's going to help you find that next step to connect with us. And in that, we can help direct you to whatever is that next step in your life to connect you, not just with content, which you found, but also with the body, with other believers, with people who are walking the same journey, whether it be from a place of honest questions and doubt to a place of, hey, I wanna grow and mature in my relationship with God. But we wanna thank you for tuning in with us. We love spending the time with you and we'll see you later.